Hello, today is September 14th, 2009. We're meeting today with Mr. Robert Anderman at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Bob, and uh, thanks for participating today. Let's start out, if we could, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay. Um, I was born in, uh, well, sir, I was born in Hinsdale, Illinois, <coughs> yeah, excuse me, Illinois, 1923, in September, of poor but honest parents. And when I was born, I was born twins, and my pa said to my ma, let's keep this one and drown that one, and that's how I learned how to swim. <laughs> so there. Uh, yeah, I was born in Hinsdale, Illinois. And uh, uh, well, I had two sisters. And uh, oh, well, of course, the Depression, you know, was pretty impressive. Do, do you have memories of that? Uh, can oh, you share any memories? Uh... Yeah, I can remember one family in particular that lived in the neighborhood, um, they had two boys that I knew the best, and one was in my class, and the other one was a year ahead of me. But uh, We were going to a, a Lutheran school, and we, you know, it was about a mile away, so we walked in and carried our lunch, except the arm brusters, the, the two boys, their father had been killed by a ho horse kick, and there was no relief then. And I can remember that as kids begging for half sandwiches when we were eating lunch. Mm. It was that bad. And how did how did it did it have much of an effect on your family, or were you managed? To yeah, uh, we managed be uh, better than they did because we uh, had vacant land on all around us. Or except in back, and uh, we truck farmed to beat the Dickens. And Dad was working as a stevedore for the railroad in, um, in Chicago, and, and uh, instead of laying people off, they spread the work around. And there, there was a long period where he worked two half days a week. Yeah, two, two half days a week. And uh, it, when he got paid, he'd go down to uh, probably Goldblatt's had just opened their store in Chicago. And uh, in the basement, they had a grocery. And he'd come home with a chunk of beef. It was sometimes four cents a pound, maybe seven cents a pound. You can imagine that today. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> and, uh. um, but we, and we kept chickens, and uh, <coughs> uh, that's where I learned to hate spinach because mother boiled the heck out of everything. <laughs> they <laughs> cook spinach; it's, it's better raw. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. nothing. You never ate anything raw, really, really. But um, but with the truck farm and such, you you guys managed to, at least you you. Had yeah. food, yeah. yeah, and you know those armbruster boys, um, they trapped uh, uh, rabbits out in the fields around us. They make little wire uh, uh, copper nooses and post them in the rabbit runs, you know, in the, in the prairie. And uh, I say, oh, yeah, there was I picked up coal along the railroad to burn in the stove and. Mm. You know, stuff like that. Mm. So you grew up and went through the school system there in Hinsdale? Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, I went through the to the eighth grade in the Lutheran school, and then I went up to high school and graduated in 1941. So that would have been the spring of 41, correct? Yes. Okay. And then... Uh, and, uh, yeah, I was 17 <laughs> when we graduated, and... and uh, it wasn't until September that I turned 18, and but in the meantime, you know, I couldn't get a job anywhere. They were beginning to hire them a little bit, but I couldn't get a job because I wasn't 18 yet. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. And by the time I was 18, I had a 
job in the grocery store, and I stayed there be, because the war was inevitable. Right. And uh, there was no reason to be running from one job to another. And uh, when it broke out, uh, two brothers that I palled around with in high school and I went, um, well, it wasn't right away. My mother wouldn't sign for me until I was 19. So I, right after they passed the 19-year-old draft law, that was uh, 1942, um, two, yeah, because I got in on November uh, 42. Well, it, let, me, let me back up and ask you, do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard Pearl Harbor had been bombed? Oh, well, we were, um, we were ice skating, as a matter of fact. It was a nice cold winter, and, and uh, we were ice skating. And we came home in the afternoon and, you know, the folks had the radio on and they had told us, and so we sat and listened. Um, but, you know, if you were growing up at that time and, and uh, didn't know we were going to get into a war, you were dreaming. And you just... so, so there was a feeling before that that, oh, we were going to eventually get into this thing. Oh, certainly, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, you know, we'd gone through the... The uh, Len Lee spit and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all the arguments and uh, oddly enough, I read the newspapers starting as soon as I could read, and uh, 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 what am I saying? I'm losing track. Oh, uh, yeah, when we yeah, the radio, the, the you know the radio comic shows were were full of the war too. And uh, I remember particularly, uh, you know, at the time uh, Germany had gone into Russia, and we get reports of how, how many planes the Germans sent over Moscow to bomb, and Moscow would tell us how many he shot down, and there was always a huge discrepancy. <laughs> In fact, uh, I think it was uh, on Eddie Cantor's show, they were doing something, and then they in interrupted it for a newscast. They said uh, today the Germans sent uh, 200 planes over uh, over Moscow, and Moscow shot down uh, 420, <laughs> and they also shot down the moon and two enemy stars. <laughs> that's how, you know, that's how believable that was. <laughs> so you you carried on at the at the grocery store through. Uh, uh, most of 42 and then and then you said in November you went into the service November of 40 yeah, uh, 42 of November yeah uh, uh, you and you said two buddies went yeah, in together two brothers yeah yeah we went in and, and uh, into Chicago and now uh, were you were you drafted or did you uh, enlist no, we were we were proposed to be drafted okay yeah, just past the 19 year old okay all right yeah draft law and uh, well I tried to get in the Marines they claimed I had a flat foot so I ate lunch and I went back in and joined the Navy. <laughs> now, why did you, here's a, uh, a boy from the prairies of Illinois, uh, or Indiana, uh, how did you come to choose the Navy? Um, well, I just didn't think I ought to be in the Army. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <Yeah>. fair enough. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how I would have reacted there, you know. Uh, and did the two brothers join the Navy as well? No, they, uh, one of them got in the Air Force. And uh, Bill, well, I guess he was in the Air Force too, be, because but he was in a, a, a flying engi engineer outfit in the Pacific. Okay. They were supposed to fly in and build an airstrip. Gotcha. And, and uh, airborne is what uh, the term would then. Uh, well, so I uh, I joined the Navy uh, on the 30th of November and. Well, that's when I went and got sworn in on the 30th of November, and and uh, we were supposed to, uh, we were thinking, I was thinking we'd go to boot camp at Great Lakes, mm -hmm, which is right. right up the hill. Right. Forget that, you know. Well, the night we were sworn in, the mayor came in and talked to us, and he said, I'll see you on the streets on Liberty, and they put us on a train, sent us to Farragut, Idaho. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It took three or four days to get there, I think, huh. because we used every bit of railroad in the country to get up there. Oh, boy. And uh, that boot camp was uh, partially still under construction. 
it was vast though. The, uh, there were five camps and I, I think each one of them had 20 or 30 two-story barracks and there was 120 men on each floor of the barracks and and uh, uh, I was in the class of 142-42 and <laughs> that was our designation. That's how we got our mail. How was condition? How were conditions there? I mean, you you got there in the middle of winter, yeah. pretty much, uh, and oh, it was under yeah. construction. Where you? Oh, it was cold, uh, and there was snow, and uh, eventually everyone got cat fever. I don't. That has a full name, but it starts out with cat something. Um, and uh, I know when I got it, I turned in, turned myself in, and I went to uh, a hospital barracks. I spent Christmas there. <laughs> well, that leads to a question too. Here was, uh, uh, like many in your in your generation in that time period, you really didn't travel too far away from home growing up. No. Now you're off uh, uh, off to the service for the first time away from home on Christmas, no less. How how was that for you as far as homesickness and well, and such? I was too sick to worry about it. <laughs> okay. But it did make a difference later on, you know, uh, after we got got out to sea in Pearl Harbor, there was a Christmas that uh, I can, when we get that okay. far, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. mention that, but uh, uh, we learned to drill and tie knots, and we had 13 weeks of training. And, and how was that, once again, uh, going from civilian life into military life? Was that much of a transition for you, or did uh, Well, um, I don't think I even worried about it that much, because... Um, I knew it was going to be different, and it certainly was. And mostly, what we learned, uh, what we really learned, was how to take care of ourselves, you know, which is not happening today, no. you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, oh, we got lectures, and uh, we got movies on uh, uh, venereal disease, one of which. Uh, Ronald Reagan appeared and, and everyone thought that was so wonderful and, <laughs> and he just came in the door and stood there, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, when we first hit the camp and we, uh, you know, we showered and gave up our civilian clothes and uh, uh, we got partly dressed and we walked down the line and they started punching our shoulders with shots. And, I mean, they'd hit you in both shoulders at a time, you know. Wow. <laughs> and as fast as you could come come in, and, and uh, if somebody passed out, which they did occasionally, and they got set aside for a bit, <laughs> uh. fell in later. But in a boot company, uh, being all all you know, all these guys were from the Chicago area, or most. Oh, really? Of them okay. Were, yeah, and uh, there were a lot of Polish kids. And uh, uh, most of them didn't know how to swim, of course, because just because they lived in Chicago right. near Lake Michigan, it didn't mean they ever got there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but there was a, a lad from the town uh, west of us, Downers Grove, and there was a lad from the Grange, the town east of us. We were, uh, you know, on a uh, Towns were one after another along the Burlington Railroad, and uh, uh, so we had a little touch of home, but uh, um, we had to pass a swimming test, and I just barely made that, and my buddy was from a Polish lad, Bill Soroka, he, uh, he just barely made it, uh, <laughs> he had an awful time, but he had to take the test twice, but he <laughs> made it. And because if you didn't make it, they'd set you back in a later company and give you another month of boot camp. You know? Oh, jeez, there was incentive. <laughs> yeah, nobody wanted to do that. Yeah. So we got ten days leave after that. Well, actually, we we had two li <coughs> two liberties while we were in boots. Uh, one was local in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which was a little dinky town, and. Um, uh, one we got to, they took bust us into Spokane, but uh, we got ten days leave when that was over, 
And we came back out to camp and hung around for a whole couple of weeks, maybe. So did you go back home? For yeah, the, I went home. Was that plenty of time to get back and forth? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, you know, it took uh, like a day and a half to get home anywhere, two days maybe. And so, so you didn't really have much time at home. Right, right. But uh, everybody got a boot leave anyway. Uh, and actually some kids couldn't go home, you know. Uh, at the time, there was a lot of uh, rioting in uh, Los Angeles, for instance, between the, uh, the suit suitors and the mm -hmm. service people. And so anybody that lived, lived down there couldn't go home on leave. leave you mm. know? And uh, so uh, after the boot camp, um, as I say, we hung around for a little bit, and then they packed up a bunch of us and sent us to Bremerton Navy Yard. And um, at the time at Bremerton, all the old the battleships were in there being refitted. The ones that had been sunk at Pearl and, and uh, um, the uh, Saratoga was in dry dock too. That was the time when she got re... Well, she was, you know, they were fixing up probably three or four torpedo holes for one thing, plus rem uh, rem or modernizing them. Right. At, the, at, at that time they took off, um, uh, you know, they took off the old 1.1 anti-aircraft guns, which were like four barrels, you know, that uh, were semi-automatic, but they didn't have the range or the punch and put on Beaufort's 40s. and. Uh, they took off the 50 millimeter machine gun anti-aircraft because they were useless and uh, put on the 20 millimeters. And, uh, but I was only there uh, maybe five or six days, maybe a week. I don't know exactly. And they sent a bunch of us over to uh, uh, Sandpoint Naval Air Station. That was on the other side of Seattle uh, on Lake Washington. And uh, we went over there to uh, stand watch is what they called, in what they called the armed guard. And it, uh, it was just a bunch of guys like us that uh, stood watches around the hangars and uh, uh, ramps um, at, at, the, at night because uh, everything was blacked out. Right. Okay. And, uh, uh, I'm not a gas. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, we, yeah. The armed guard. The reason it was named that is because the original guys were armed guardsmen. Off, uh, you know, that manned the single uh, five-inch guns they put on transport ships crossing the Atlantic in the uh, convoys. And uh, we stood watch with a, a sawed-off 12-gauge shotgun. Uh, semi-automatic. No. Well, no, it wasn't. It was not. It was a pump, pump, pump gun. We had, we carried uh, four shells. Each shell had about five pellets in it, <laughs> enough to break a leg, you know. <laughs> and uh, well, I stood that for. I must let's see. That's February, March. I must from March till about. Um, Oh, middle of April, they uh, passed the word that they wanted volunteers to make up the air group to go aboard the USS New Orleans. Uh, she was in dry dock at, uh, at Bremerton. And uh, so I went down and volunteered. Um, it's like I told somebody when they thanked me for my service, I told, <laughs> told them, uh, don't thank me, I got drafted. <laughs> but uh, actually, I was dumber than that. I volunteered for everything I did. <laughs> and well, I volunteered, and we made up a group. And uh, this is what they looked like uh, just before we went aboard ship. Well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll videotape that at the end of the interview, you bet. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so what was the, the whole idea behind the, the air group? What well, was the, the makeup uh, of that? See, the New Orleans carried 
uh, well, we carried two to five float planes. So was it a, a flat top or what? What was it? It was a heavy cruiser. Heavy, okay. Heavy cruiser, nine, eight-inch guns, uh, eight five-inch guns, um, twenty-four forty millimeters and twenty-eight twenty millimeters. So uh, that was our armament. But the the main main armament was the nine, eight-inchers. Uh, they were. Accurate, they at 20 miles, so wow. when they were new, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, we made up a group and we trained with we had two planes and, and uh, three pilots, and we trained, uh, you know, at the beach. We had to beach the plane and uh, beat it when it came back in and fit a dolly underneath it. So the tractor could pull it out of the water and, and so forth and, and uh, oh that was mainly what we did. What, what was your responsibility in the unit? Well, I was just a seaman, so I was uh, I was supposed to be working with the metalsmith, which I did, but there was nothing really that we could do at the time. But uh, he did take me over to the metal shop at the main hangars and. And I got to see some of the equipment I was going to maybe get to use someday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, everybody had to be a striker for some future rate, you know. And uh, mechanics were big. Uh, so uh, we trained up, and in about the middle of June, we went over and joined the ship. We loaded everything onto a truck, and uh, somewhere along the line before we went over, a Red Cross got to us and gave us a, a 78 RPM record player in a satchel, a wind-up job. Mm -hmm. And I think we had six rubber records. But the only two I can remember were, and the only time we played, used them was when, on the trip over to the ship. Uh, <laughs> The, the one one record was the Sheik of Araby, and the other one was a, a, a terrible country western called A Letter Edged in Black. <laughs> and, you know, after I got out, we were going to garage sales around town here, and I found that record. Is and, that right? Yeah, I still got it down there. It's the awfulest <laughs> music you've ever heard, that <laughs> Letter Edged in Black. And, well, anyway, after we got aboard ship, we didn't have any place to keep that, so it got into a locker, and I never did see it again. I imagine it stayed with the ship when we got off. But uh, we shook down uh, in uh, Puget Sound. And, you now, know, uh, for those that will watch this tape, a, a shakedown is when you go out and kind of work all the bugs out of... Uh, yeah, out of, you see how she works. Yeah. Okay, okay. They check her for speed and... and uh, then we paused for a couple of days at anchor out there while they degaussed us uh, as they hung cables underneath the ship from side to side to demagnetize it. Hmm. And uh, in, on those trips we, uh, uh, we, we docked one time for a couple of days in, in Seattle, right in the docks there. And uh, so we had an easy liberty there. In fact, there were Griff and I were were Liberty buddies, and, and uh, uh, we worked together all the time. In the uh, you know uh, when we were training up, and we were heading for shore one night, and we met two of our mechanics going ashore, and they took us under tow and, and took us into a joint and taught us how to drink beer. <laughs> and. Uh, I don't know how I got back that night, but I did get back. <laughs> I probably walked, but or staggered. <laughs> but uh, we sat down at a table with four, for four, and uh, a lady, a young lady, came and we ordered four beers, and uh, she brought them and they ordered eight, and she brought them and they ordered eight more, and pretty soon that she never took anything away. Pretty soon the table was just full of empties and half empties and full ones <laughs> and you just reached out and drank if you wanted to <laughs> and uh, 
that was a memorable <laughs> uh, liberty. Uh, the reason the ship was in is because she had been uh, in the Battle of Tassafaranga where she lost her bow complete with number one turret. Wow. And when they brought her up to the, the States, they had her bow, a new bow, all built up in dry dock for her. And uh, they just had to uh, run the ship, the parts together, and weld them and hook up the power. And, but she was still missing the turret. So as Minneapolis came in, she also had lost her bow, but in front of number one turret. So they took her turret off and put it in ours because they were building one and uh, she got the new one finally. And uh, of course, uh, we got her turret and they had relined the barrels on all the ships. That was an important thing. And uh, well, we, uh, we hung around and, you know, and shook, shook down as much as we could and, uh, or needed to in Puget Sound. And then we were supposed to get down to San Diego uh, for gunnery. And uh, they, I think they hurried us up on that because the guys that had been on the ship when she got hit, when she was in danger of going back to sea, they started going over the hill. And uh, a bunch of them had left us. We got down to San Diego and uh, we spent two weeks there on gunnery. We were supposed to have four, but they were going over the hill so badly that uh, they picked us up and took us down to Pearl where they couldn't get away from us. <laughs> they couldn't get away. Uh, and they kept catching up with us after, later on because they'd do a little brig time and they'd get uh, part of their sentence was 18 months of hazardous duty and they'd send them out with us and, I, and we thought, well, what the, what the <laughs> how come we're here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, well, let me uh, interrupt you real quick, uh, Bob. How was that, uh, once again, Growing up in Indiana, uh, really never being out to sea, how was that going out to sea? Did you get your sea legs, or how was? Uh... Oh, you know, I never had any problem. With no. it. I never had, never got seasick. Hmm. Uh, I used to love to <coughs> love to ride the uh, roller coasters and stuff. You know, a lot of people got sick on those things. And just never bothered. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I. Uh, I just kept my mouth shut and, and uh, did what I was supposed to. And you learn to walk, you know, the, if the ship's rough, you learn which way to go when, it, when she's rolling that way. And, and uh, that's, <laughs> that's what are, are called sea legs. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we, we, it wasn't rough, you know, on that trip uh, down to San Diego and, and it was easy getting out to Pearl. Uh, we had some storms on and on and off when I was on, you know, when we were working later out on. there. But uh, later on, but uh, that was easy. easy. Anyway, um, uh, I don't know that I had one or two liberties in Pearl. Uh, we would only get one of one out of four, you know, one every four days. Uh, they'd only let a quarter of the ship off or the order of the complement off the ship at a time. So uh, um, if you got drunk and in trouble like some of the guys, they would uh, penalize you with, uh, say, four liberties. That meant you may never get ashore again. You know? Right, yeah. <laughs> because you'd be in there uh, and you're just ready to go to shore and the ship would go to sea. <laughs> and then, then you were done. Anyway, I never got into trouble like that, but uh, uh, after the first uh, trip to sea and, you know, to first action and we came back into Pearl, I knew what I had to do. I, I went to around to, uh, uh, there were two or three stores that I went to. They had sold uh, used pocketbooks for one thing and used magazines. And I find all the um, uh, Saturday evening posts in consecutive order that I could because they had a continuing story in them. You had to have something to read out there, or oh, at least boy. I did. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'd buy pocketbooks, as many as I, 
you know, like a dozen of them. And uh, when I, and all this stuff, when I read it, I'd pass it on and I'd never see it again. That just, everybody, you know, was dying for something to do. Uh, when we weren't in action, the trip to and from was very boring. Was it? Oh boy. And, uh, you know, we just sat there. And, uh, well, the first time we went out, uh, we went to uh, Wake Island. Uh, we made a raid on Wake Island October 5th and 6th, 1942. And uh, we had four brand new carriers with us. Two new Essex and two new um, CVLs. The Bella Wood was one of them. I can't remember the other end. Probably got it written down somewhere, but uh, uh, previous to that, there was only one uh, at the, like at the beginning of May uh, in '42, uh, the US, uh, HMS Illustrious, a British carrier, arrived in Pearl Harbor. We only had one carrier at sea. That was the uh, Enterprise, uh, you know, because uh, the Sarah was up in. Bremerton when when I was there and she was still there when we got down to Pearl and uh, uh, We had uh, four brand new carriers Yeah, and we we spent two days uh, uh, Plugging away at them bombarding and uh, for our first action it was a baptism of fire for us because or, you know, uh, those of us that were inexperienced, because we were, we got a lot of shore, shore uh, fire. They had uh, dual five inch guns that they had taken from the British at Singapore, and uh, they were pretty accurate. And mm. we were, we got straddled two or three times. That's, you know, they fire one up and one down and see where they hit and then try to. Local, localize it and and uh, on you know, you know they they fall a short of us and the captain would move in move us in and then the next ones would go over and then pretty soon they'd straddle us and one time they straddled us and and uh, we just kicked it kicked up the speed that's another thing he did would change speed and uh, he kicked up the speed and the next uh, Shells that came from the beach fell right in our wake. Oh boy! We <laughs> and you know they were colored. They had uh, the explosions were red and green, so they could tell which gun was uh, doing the hitting. You know. And uh, uh, the first day we got a lot of air action. Uh, first from Pearl Har uh, or from uh, Wake Island, the planes that were there. And then they were flying some fighter pl or fighter bombers in from as far away as uh, uh, the Kwajalein Islands and the uh, Marshall Islands. Now, where, what was your general quarters? Uh, at, the, for, at that action, I didn't have a, a station, and uh, I know the chief and I and probably a couple of other the guys spent our time on the on the well deck. Uh, We'll see that later in a yeah. picture, but uh, uh, we just stood there and, and uh, you know, when they were coming at us, and uh, I remember a plane coming in at a, uh, on a torpedo run, skimming the water, and I guess it was us, we hit them flat on the nose with a five-inch shell, and just little pieces fell, you huh. know, wow. uh, bomb. Gasoline, everything went up in one one round, and uh, I spent a lot of time on the deck trying to dig a foxhole. <laughs> yeah, well, and, what, what, what goes through, uh, through your mind for uh, people like myself or those that watch it? I've never been in conditions like that. What are you thinking? How how are you acting? I mean, what's going through your mind in a situation like that? I don't know. I was scared. Yeah, <laughs> and, but I did notice that uh, there was a man. Uh, you know, he was a first class gunner's mate or something. He was on the well deck with a pair of goggles on, and he just stood at the rail with his arms on the rail. And he reported which guns uh, were firing, you know, because inside the turret they don't know for sure if right. the gun uh, 
really unloaded. And uh, so he, he'd report on that stuff and he'd report on where the hits were. We finally got uh, uh, a, shell's, um, a shell close enough to punch holes in the hangar in the hangar and in the, the uh, crew, crew's quarters below us and there was some minor flooding but uh, uh, another thing that happened that, that uh, first day was or maybe it was the second day I'm not sure which day but the, anyway it was our uh, one of our planes was shot down uh, right and we could see it right off you know a couple of miles off over, over the island uh, when you say one of your planes, one of your float planes, or one of our yeah, American? Our oh, planes, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our senior aviator, Lieutenant Roberts, and, and we had a new radioman named McCarthy. That were, they were in the, in the plane, and they parachuted out, and uh, you could see uh, when they were floating down their chutes, they'd collapse the chute to slip, to slip away because the, fight, the fighter plane was strafing them. Uh, we thought it was a Japanese plane, but in the last few years, uh, through the articles I found in the World War II magazine, it was friendly fire. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I could uh, I could look in my notes and find the name of the pilot if you wanted. Yeah. It. <laughs> uh. And uh, uh, anyway, the uh, radioman got hit badly in the knee when they came in behind him. You know, he was right in, first one to take the shot. He got out, and uh, Lieutenant Roberts got hit in the thigh, and uh, his fingers were torn up from pulling on the shrouds when he'd slip. And he said when he slipped, slipped away as soon as he let go, he pulled his, he had a 38 revolver. He was firing back at him. So, <laughs> uh, he, that was, and that was, we never, we never saw them again. Yeah. They never got back to the ship. Uh, you get shot down, you go home go back to the States and uh, unless you really fight it like some, like some of the some pilots did but uh, <clears throat> uh, the chief had when we got back to Pearl and the chief said he had uh, uh, gone over to the hospital with a couple of the officers to see the guys that you know after they'd gotten shot down and uh, well, that trip over, we went back to Pearl, and then we spent quite a long time there, um, uh, finding exactly how much we, we yeah, and when we were when we were back in Pearl, like that, they'd take us with the airplanes off and put us on Fort Island, and uh, Fort Island was, uh, of course, the airstrip, mm -hmm. and. Uh, We'd fly our planes from there and, and, open, and work on them. And, and one day, one of the guys came up and said, hey, did you see those crazy guys in the hangar over there? They're installing a cannon in a B-25. And we went and looked, and, and uh, sure enough, they were. And uh, in my post-war reading, I found that the uh, Australians, they were Aussies that were doing that. We knew that. Uh, had set 155 millimeter cannon in the nose of a B a B-25s for use in Burma, and but they didn't say how many shots they could fire before the plane had to go in for overhaul, because <laughs> you know, that had to be an awful impact. That's a pretty big round. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, with that being over, our next trip was. Uh, in uh, November, we went to uh, uh, the Tarawa Macon landings. We supported the landing on Macon. That was the 20, 27th Army Division that landed there. And uh, it was pretty une une uneventful for us. Um, the Mississippi, however, was you know, there were a couple of old battleships out there, um, and Mississippi was one. And you know, we'd go in the cruisers, uh, we'd pull back, and the battleships would come through and take their turn. And 
Uh, the Mississippi blew out a turret one day, which lost uh, almost 35 to 40 men, I mm. guess. Uh, because inside the turret, it was all one big room. And if this gun, you know, uh, uh, if the powder went off before they got the breech closed, everybody got hurt, yeah. you know. And, so you guys, you'd come in and soften the beach for the invasions, or what was your... Yeah, okay. yeah, we, uh, for the initial landings, yeah, we pounded away, and then we uh, furnished support fire, you know, as, as the invasion uh, progressed. How far off the beach would you guys normally be about? Um, a couple of miles. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that was pretty close. Uh, and that went... Uh, well, yeah, and to get there, we had to cross the equator, so on the way back to Pearl, we had a... a Polywog? Yeah, a, a shell back initiations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, most of the ship was, most of the guys on the ship were Polywog, you know. And so it was, it was a, a mess. It was, um, uh, you know, they were trying to hit you and keep you wet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I know when I went through the paddle line, I got hit right on the, uh, what's that, a little bone at the end of your spine. You get hit there, boy. I went flat down on my face. <laughs> Man, that hurt. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, I heard it's a pretty pretty tough initiation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, the guys, some of the guys were kind of rough. I know there were some reprimands after that from the way they were treating some of the guys. But one of the, you know, one of our guys uh, uh, leading up to it the day before, he was walking along the well deck rail with a bucket of water and I said, ask him what he was doing. He said, well, it's the, I'm watering the seaweed. <laughs> Sprinkling water over the side. <laughs> that was and, uh, another another guy. Uh, well, this was. Well, we had two initiations. Uh, we had one, uh, uh, you know, some months later again. But uh, and leading up to that one, we had wrecked a plane. One of our planes. Uh, we were lifting it up from the well deck to the catapult, and the the uh, crane goofed up, and it snapped like that and the plane tore loose and dropped down on the well deck and we all got out scattered out of the way except one guy got hit on the head by one of the floats the wingtip float and uh, when we went through the when he went through the uh, paddle line they accused him of hitting himself over an airplane wrecking sane insane so <laughs> that's how things went uh, well, we went back to Pearl after that, and, and uh, we had uh, the initiation on the way back. We got back to Pearl, we had Thanksgiving dinner, and then we were ashore through Christmas and New Year's uh, over on the uh, Ford Island. And that was the Christmas I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Christmas Eve, and I we were, they had a, a hangar full of double deck bunks, that's where we were living, and it was just full of the ice. And I had just hit the sack, I was trying to go to sleep, and, and uh, it was dark, you know, everything was blacked out. And they brought a guy in, no, um, uh, at first a trumpeter stood outside the barracks and blew silent night, you know. Very homesick. Oh, boy. And then they brought a guy in that was raging drunk, and he was yelling and screaming and, you know, obscenities. And, and uh, all of a sudden there was a thwack and it got quiet. <laughs> <laughs> they cooled him down. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it kind of took, took the steam out of the Christmas. Yeah, you know, right. Homesick. Ah. <laughs> uh, after Christmas, um, the next action was uh, Kwajalein, uh, Roy, and oh, I can't remember all the names of the yeah. islands, but uh, that that went on for quite a bit. And at one point, we were well going into it. We uh, 
bombarded a little island or one of the chain islands and we had a, a kind of a duel with the shore battery and we got straddled again and uh, we did finally si silenced the battery and then we uh, we got on and there were three AKs transport ships that had gotten out of the lagoon and they were trying to make a run for it. Of course they were real slow and we were ordered to take them under fire and we did and we put one down and damaged another and we had to quit because we only had so much ammunition we still had the landings at the uh -huh. main landing to make you know so after the main landing you know we had uh, there was an army division there too and we had uh, we had three or four planes aboard at that time because we were we had a uh, army observer flying for well they were taking this island this little one had nothing on it so they went over there and set up their artillery and they were bomb, bomb bombarding from there and uh, we we had an army man flying our rear seat to spot for them okay and uh, we gave support fire we were at anchor and we were firing support fire and they were we were firing eight inch and 20 millimeter at the same target it was amazing and they depressed the, we were far enough away and, and they could depress the, depress the eight inch guns so that if a little, if they were a little under power, you know, because of the powder bag, um, and they didn't have quite the speed, they hit the water and skip right on over the island. You know. Wow! And, and I don't know, I can't tell you how long that went on. Yeah. But we went back to Pearl, and we were there very shortly, and we came out again. Uh, we weren't there very long, and uh, when we came out again, after that we were out of out of Pearl for ten months. The first six months, first first six months of which, I never got ashore. Wow! There was no place to go. You know, we uh, uh, they had an island that they were getting ready for, but it wasn't ready while we were there. You know. And uh, we came back out for Saipan, Tinian, Guam, that operation. And uh, that, uh, I think, was the worst because we were underway so long, you know, so much that we couldn't resupply. And we were on, they had cut our rations by a third. And uh, oh, and we, we would, uh, we, we bombarded for the landing on Saipan and then we gave supporting fire and we went down to Guam to punch away for a couple of days and we got called out for the the big uh, uh, first battle of the Philippine Sea is what it was called the turkey shoot where mm -hmm. Very the turkey Japanese shoot. carriers came out and we were on the guns from well before we were always uh, an hour before gun before dawn but we were on on the guns until somewhere around midnight that day, and uh, fire. Uh, I was I was on loading a twenty millimeter, which is a, a top turret three. So we had a real heavy good swing. Not we had over hundred and eighty degrees, and uh, so we fired a lot of ammunition. And uh, uh, at one time our gun was so hot. The gunner wanted to cool it, and uh, on the gun shield there was a tube, uh, well maybe four or five feet long, four feet long, probably that's about all our shields were, that was full of water, and you take the barrel out and cool half of it, and pull it out and turn it over and cool the other half. Well we did that, when you uh, put a hot barrel in the six inch tube full of water, it runs up the bore and converts to steam. And, squirts about 12 feet in the air. Wow. wow. <laughs> and, and, and when we got done, and we looked in the barrel, and I know the gunner's uh, heart sank because somewhere along the line, somebody had dropped a 
candy wrapper in there and the paper had dissolved and there were little bits of paper stuck all over in that barrel. So we're trying to clean it and it's still pretty hot. Uh, we had one pair of uh, asbestos gloves that the gunner was wearing, but uh, he had to take them off and we were, two of us were holding the barrel and two of them were trying to get the cleaning rod through it. And what do we get on the phone? They're coming in again. Uh. <laughs> we're, we've all got heat rash and we're sweating. <laughs> and, uh, um, well, we got the barrel back in and met them again. And, and uh, of course, you know, when the, uh, toward evening, when our, our planes were way over extended the, our attack planes uh, on their gasoline and and they were coming back and, and uh, the first thing they did with the destroyers were waving their headline, uh, head, or their searchlights to point the way back to the fleet. and uh, Which from what I understand normally you wouldn't do, it was always a blackout, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, then we had to turn on the, all our running lights so that uh, uh, and then we turned on our running lights and uh, they lit up the carriers, of course, but, you know, when they could only see the running lights, they couldn't tell which was which. Oh, boy. So we had to shut off, shut them off, you know, very quickly. But the planes were dropping in the water and, and I remember the next morning there was a, uh, we got close to one of the carriers and there was an opening on the side of the carrier and Probably there was light in there and a plane had tried to land in there because you could see the superstructure or the side of the ship was, the hangar deck was dented where the wings hit it, you know. Hmm. Uh, uh, actually, we didn't lose very many pilots, though. Uh, and they were picking them up, you know, uh, right along the destroyers. Uh, mostly got that duty. We, we would never stop. Uh, you know, to pick up. Uh, we were too, too big and too good a target when we were stopped. Right. Uh, well, when I was over, we went back down to Guam and, and we bombarded. I know from the ship's log there was a, a seven day period where we bombed every day and we bombarded from sunup to sundown and furnished. Uh, Harassing fire all night with the five-inch guns, you know, a sporadic one shot here, a few minutes later, two shots maybe. And, so uh, were you at the gun the entire time, or could you get relieved to come and, and rest, or go get a bite to eat, or how to well, go uh, to the bathroom? Uh, 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 you know, after we made a run, we'd they'd circle around, and we'd get a break, for, you know, to hit the hit the uh, head. Uh, we ate on the post uh, at noontime. Two guys had come with uh, each carrying two buckets. Uh, one was, one had a bucket of some red stuff, <laughs> uh, ground up uh, meat, and uh, or blue stuff, or brown stuff, and uh, another a bucket full of slices of bread. And the other guy had some red ground up meat. and. Uh, a bucket of, and they'd put a slice on your hand and put a, a gob of brown on it and you got two slices of bread and a gob of red, another slice of bread and you had two sandwiches. <laughs> um, I think, I'm sure that red stuff was horse meat. Oh boy. Um, actually horse meat isn't good, isn't bad. It's just, it's better than beef I think. Really? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's just our uh, uh, ethic on horses yeah, right. you know, through the Old West because they eat it in Europe and for when they uh, kill our wild horses for slaughter they go to Europe you know and don't you know that uh, there was uh, the guys on the ground over in Europe were using a lot of horses and when they got killed and the, and the battle moved on the civilians came out to cut up to remains because they needed food badly. Um, 
Now, you, yeah. had, you had mentioned uh, being out on the guns and, and that heat and, the, and such, you'd gotten heat rash. Uh, was that, uh, how severe was that? How bad was that for you? Well, you had it, <laughs> it was bad, um, you, just all over. I know some of the guys would it'd get under your arms and, and just moving your arms, it were, you know, this, they'd get raw. And uh, if you were just sitting there and something startled you, they all stuck, all those little red spots stuck at one time, you know. And, and uh, you know, as soon as we got a break, uh, uh, especially during that air attack, our, our uh, life jackets were backpacks that wrapped around, and we always kept them wrapped around because they were known to stop a piece of shrapnel now and then. And, uh, but as soon as the pressure was off, we'd open that up and get some air in there, you know. And that was awful. Is that the reason why, one of the reasons why you got such a severe case was because of those uh, yeah. black oh, jackets? Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I carried my wallet until uh, for a while, and then one day I noticed that when I was taking a shower that I had a square patch of heat rash on my oh, geez. back pockets. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, quit carrying the wallet, you know. <laughs> how did how did you get relief from something like that? I mean, was there wasn't any? Oh boy, there just wasn't any. If if it got bad, they'd put some stuff called blue vitriol on it, and it was some something purple. I I don't know if it did any good or not. Hmm. But is that something that bothered you through the whole uh, your whole time out, oh, or yeah. was just that one? Yeah, oh. yeah it went on all the time. Hmm. Once you got hot, you stayed hot. <laughs> and uh, oh, and those uh, that uh, those uh, dawn to dusk bombardments, we'd pull off um, to spend the night a little bit. We'd pull off and have the evening meal, and then we'd come back in and offer sporadic fire. But uh, we we rolled out around four in the morning uh, at Reveille and and. Uh, Every morning we had beans for breakfast, mm. and we were like, like I said before, we were on, we had cut our rations by a third, and uh, uh, cut our rations by a third. I'm losing track again. Um, yeah, the beans for breakfast. Yeah, uh, one night when we pulled off, we had three kinds of beans. We had green beans and navy beans and Boston beans, and I think the cooks were playing games with us. You know, at one point we made a run up to Saipan overnight uh, because we to pick up ammunition. And uh, coming out of the harbor, I was below decks, and there was a. Um, of a vent with a fan in it, pulling air down in the first deck below, below the main deck, and and uh, the flies were coming in like crazy, uh, bouncing off us if you got close to that thing. And we were steaming, we steamed through a, a covey of um, Japanese bodies. The guys that had jumped off the cliff, or or maybe waded mm -hmm. out into the water to get away from the Marines, uh, or drowned and we're floating and we picked up one in our water intake and uh, evaporated the water and drank it and we all got dysentery. Oh boy. <laughs> oh. Until we got, <laughs> and that hung on and for I don't know how many days until we got to a point where we could anchor again and the engineering officer dived down and cleaned out the intake. And, mm. uh, but Saipan, Tinian, and Guam were the worst uh, for the endurance. Yeah, how, how do you, when you look back on that now, how do you think you managed? I mean, you, you had heat rash, you, you probably weren't sleeping very well, obviously the food wasn't very good. All this under the, the umbrella of being in, in battle, I mean, each one individually would be enough to, to knock a person out, but you had all this piled on to you. How do you, how do you think you, you, you managed to function during that time? Well, it didn't seem to... It just seemed normal, you know. 
um, because you don't know any better. And when you get away from it, uh, uh, you know, like when you get to a place where you can get into town, uh, I, I know I had culture shock really bad. I just couldn't talk to people. Huh. Unless they swore or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, yeah, and you know, in in, in there somewhere, uh, we had, oh, well, maybe that was at Kwajalein, we had made a raid on Truck Island, and Truck was supposed to be the Pearl Harbor or the Pacific for the Japanese, and there was a lot of shipping in there, and we sank a lot, and, uh, uh, well, we bombarded, and then, of course, the airstrikes, we had, we always traveled with four carriers, and there were usually two two task groups, so there were eight carriers. And uh, well, like at uh, the Battle of Lady Gulf, when we got to there, they had brought in a, a lot of um, jeep carriers built on transports, just because they could carry 35 or 40 planes. I don't know how many, they, I don't remember how many they carried, but they could put that many planes in the air. But they, you know, they had to be protected. Anyway, uh, uh, that raid on truck uh, was supposed to be pretty momentous. And actually for us, there was, there was some action. Um, when something came up that was other than just riding with the carriers, they'd break off the cruisers to go in and take care of it. Well, they broke off two car two cruisers. We were one of them, and we had the Iowa and the Missouri, I think, with us. Two brand new battleships, um, and uh, there was a, we were going after because there was a couple of some ships that had gotten out of the harbor, and. Uh, we took on two light cruisers. Well, the first thing we came on was a tanker, and she was kind of dead in the water, and the battleships took it, took her under fire with their five-inch guns, and, and they, they were hitting her. You could see the bursts, and then all of a sudden the whole thing went up in a column of smoke. Boy, that must have been a sight. Oh, and we steamed, you know, right through the water after the smoke was gone, and there were little pieces floating, and there was one man I know that was floating, mm -hmm. or swimming. Uh, of course, we didn't stop, and as far as I know, he's probably still swimming, yeah. you know, somewhere. But we uh, assisted in putting down a cruiser and a destroyer that day. And, you know, they were over the horizon, we never really got a good look at them. But we could see the cruiser's pants. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and uh, then we make a tour, made a tour around the island looking for more, but there was nothing else. And uh, I suppose that we went back to Kowajalan then and, and uh, continued uh, what we were doing there. But uh, somewhere in there, we uh, made a trip down to the Admiralty Islands. Uh, there was a, a Seattle, Seattle Harbor. Uh, the guys, when they told us about it, they mispronounce it as Seattle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and of course it wasn't, but it was a nice place to go. Um, I think I had, by before that, I had one liberty on Bikini Island. That was the first one we hit, and we had, you know, we went ashore there for four hours, and they gave us... Uh, four bottles of beer or two bottles, I don't remember which, but it was hot because it was stored out in the sun. Oh, <laughs> boy. <laughs> but uh, I know there were, I know some of the guys, uh, you know, they wouldn't drink no matter what, and they'd pass their beer on, and there was a couple of knife fights. So after that, when we went ashore, they make us take our knife, or leave our knives <laughs> aboard. You know, we all, all tried to carry a sheath knife because they were good in case you needed to cut down a life raft. <laughs> so, uh, uh, 
we went down to the Admiralty Islands and we got a lot of uh, uh, a lot of recruits. We refilled our complement and we got two new pilots. And uh, uh, oh, we had cold beer there. Mm. They had reefers and we had cold beer. And that was where well, we were coming back to the, uh, heading back to the, well, they did, had run a lot of uh, beach sand out and made a jetty about half a mile out into the lagoon. And we were tied up uh, about the third ship or boat out. And the, we were, they brought us ashore in a, a tank landing craft, mm -hmm. uh, just had a big well deck. We put about 300 guys in there and, and uh, maybe more, I don't know. We were standing up, there was no, nothing to sit on anyway. And uh, we had to climb out of that. And, and uh, well, to get back to the ship that day, we, uh, uh, we were about, uh, our boat was about the fourth one out. And one of our pilots was standing on the, on the jetty there and he told us which boat it was. He didn't know us from Adam, but he said, if you're from the New Orleans, it's that boat and so we we just uh, got up there's a way to walk along the, at the back end you there's enough steel to walk on you know uh, where the, um, the coxswain is and stuff and we just walked down out there and jumped down even if we were a little woozy and <laughs> that poor guy when he came aboard he was scared he was crawling on his hands and knees and we got a kick out of that but, uh, before we went to uh, join the uh, the boat. There was a, a, a outrigger canoe close to the beach, and, and uh, there were three of us. Probably Griff and Chester Korzanowski. He was from Chicago, and uh, he said, "Let's go trade with the natives." You know, he says, "Let me do the talking. I got time on Maxwell Street." So <laughs> we walked out in the water, about up to our just uh, over our waist, and. Uh, we were bargaining with them, and, <laughs> and I bought a, uh, a little carved stick that he had carved and stained. And an interesting thing, we tried to pay him with paper. No, no, he didn't want paper. And we went, tried to use quarters. He wouldn't take a quarter, but he'd take half dollars <laughs> because he could hammer the silver. And, you know, they were still silver. He could hammer the silver into an ornament, you know. So I think I had a fork of two, two half dollars to, for my stick. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's in with the box at the window over there. <laughs> uh, uh. Or maybe it isn't, but it's, uh, I still got it. It, it, uh, it was a little uh, a carved stick, and then there was a knob at one end and two little points like a spear one of which broke off because you had to carry all this stuff around in a sea bag oh, and sure. it finally got broken. And I had to park for a long time, but I lost that finally. But, uh, oh, the uh, we, we picked up, as I said, a lot of recruits and we had a nice uh, uh, show back ceremony on the way back. It was peaceful and, and uh, we had time and not an overload of guys, and so they they went through everything. I've got pictures of guys. Uh, oh, there was a royal baby and the royal yeah. cop and the royal chaplain and the royal this and that. And, and uh, the baby was the fattest man of ship aboard ship, and when you went past him, you had to kiss his belly. Yeah. And the the chaplain was a, a marine. Uh, his name was Hutch. He had been a long time in the Marines uh, at sea, and he'd been up and down the bottom two rungs so many times they were worn out. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he was the chaplain. And uh, I met a man in, you know, in 1947, I was still in the service. Uh, a Marine uh, drinking in a bar down in Corpus Christi. And I got to talking to him and he said he was off the uh, Helena. 
And I said, oh, I knew Hutch. He was off the, he was off the hill on us. She had been sunk. And uh, we sat and, or stood actually at the bar and drank. And um, this was Sergeant Keeney, and he would, he would shout, beer is food, more beer, whenever his glass got empty. <laughs> and, uh, but he was nice. And uh, later on, uh, when uh, Red Sewell, Red Sewell had a car, his friend I was, I was buddying with him, who we'd go into town and come back late at night, and the sergeant was on the at the gate. We'd stop. He'd stop and talk. And we'd stop and talk to him, and he'd always go in the guardhouse and bring out a bottle of whiskey that he had just confiscated, and we'd all, <laughs> all have a drink. <laughs> it was a, it was kind of fun, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you were you were at home at that time, you know, but. Uh, yeah, we had a had a nice uh, ceremony. We let, as I say, we got two new two new pilots in, and uh, both ensigns. And one of them, uh, he lost one of our planes uh, on on landing. He uh, uh, when we recovered our planes, the ship would make a, a ninety degree turn into the into the wind, and the screws would kick up a slip. Slick, it would knock down the waves, and there were swells yet, but it was smoother landing, and the plane would land on a, and a taxi up on on a thing we called a sea sled, which was kind of a steel net that we dragged in the water, and she had a hook on the bottom of the float on the plane, and he'd ride up on the sled, and the hook would drop in place, and he could cut off the engine, and we could pick them up, pick him up, and for some reason he didn't hook. And he cut off the engine, and the plane dropped back. And uh, uh, he hit the screw guard. Mm. It broke off a wingtip float, and and uh, dropped the stern, of course, and capsized. And they both got out. Destroyer gave him, brought him back to us later that day. But uh, they, on the count of that, they always called him. Um, oh, I forgot. Forgot there was a. Uh, a cartoon character that they that was made all the mistakes you you know that they would pass around from time to time, but actually he was a good pilot and uh, he had I think he had more guts than any of the others because uh, there was a point when the gunnery officer wouldn't move the guns you know he'd say up 20, 20 yards you know if they were short. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't move the guns because he thought he knew better than the guy looking down from the sky. So after they got, you know, the idea that he wasn't listening to him, he'd go off and strafe. <laughs> well, he had one thirty caliber in the nose. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you know? And uh, one of the radio men finally said, went went to our boss, our, our senior aviator, and told him he didn't want to fly with him anymore. He was afraid, you know. <laughs> but. I got to know that guy at uh, in reunion meetings, and uh, I think he was he would have made a good fighter pilot. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he had got had the guts to do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So then, from truck, and, and you went back to Honolulu then again? Oh, no, we went back. That we went back to Kwajalein. Oh, oh, that's and right. And after I did some more work there, and after that was over, we went back to Pearl and. Uh, then when we came back out for Saipan, uh, that's when I never got ashore. Oh, okay. Hmm. And at one point we were at anchor for an awful long time. And uh, we had made that first raid on truck, which was supposed to be a, a heroic deed. Um, for us it, <laughs> it worked out pretty well. And uh, I mean, we had the power then already, you know. and. Uh, they couldn't keep up with us, and they had lost most of their pilots or good pilots already. Could, could you sense that you guys were we were taken over and, and, and getting the upper hand, or were you getting word? Was the Navy providing you with information on how the war was going? And well, we got some. We got a newsletter um, that kept us up to date. But you know, we could tell the way things were. We'd go into an island and bombard, and there was a lot of times. There, most of the time, there was no. No, not even any return mm. fire for us. Okay. You know? And uh, you know, it was 
actually kind of boring except for the noise. Uh, that's where my hearing went. Right, it, okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, we just didn't think any anything about it, you know. Um, after, I, th I guess after you get tuned to it, you just don't remember anything else. Right, right, right. Um, Would you guys listen to uh, Tokyo Rose? Was well, it? one time I, uh, uh, after the first raid on, uh, or at first action, we heard heard her speak. But after that, I don't know that they tuned her in or, I was just, you know, it had to come over the loudspeakers and they just didn't pipe it to mm. us. Mm. And I know we weren't, uh, during a lot of that time, we weren't getting much news from Europe, you know. We got a, supposed to get a newsletter every day and I saw a few of them, but uh, they weren't uh, informative enough and the folks were always wanting me to tell them if, you know, they always wanted to send me something, you know. Well, yeah, that's another question I always like to ask. With, with your ship all over the South, all over the Pacific, how was mail uh, well, getting, how was that? Uh, every per, month or every two months, maybe something. Is that like right? That, oh, know. geez. So you'd get yeah. a big bundle at once? So. Yeah, if you'd like, uh, one time I wrote home and said, uh, oh, I've got a cold. Well, it, you know, it took a month and a half to get there. And she write, mother, mother writes, and that's another month and a half, maybe two months getting back. And by that time, I never had a dude, never did anything like that again. So, you know, we couldn't tell them what we were doing. Right, right. So there was really nothing to write. It was just difficult. Uh. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, the news was so sporadic and, and uh, so slow. And when I asked him to send me a, um, a subscription to Time magazine. And uh, it came in a brown... Uh, business size envelope folded in half it was a uh, real small print and uh, you know it's a size of a sheet of paper folded in half or so a little or so and uh, um, uh, absolutely no advertising in it at all of course and when it came in the mail um, I'd watch because the guys knew what was, what was, it was a yellow envelope, so they knew what it was when they saw it. And uh, somebody yelled for next, you know, and I'd mark his, whoever he was, and when I got through with it, I'd give it to him. And But there was next, 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 you know, there were, everybody wanted a shot at it. Yeah. And I'd pass him on and I'd never, uh, never see him again. Hmm. They, <laughs> they got red to death. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, and the reason I didn't get very many of the newsletters, I f found out I, I went to a, uh, a, a, one of our reunions, and uh, the guy that uh, did our office work, he was supposed to be a storekeeper, would bring him back to us from up in front, you know, from the forward part of the ship. And uh, some of the guys got to see him, but then, like I say, I only got to see you. A couple of them, but I went to the reunion and he had three or four real thick notebooks full of them. He saved every one of them. Uh -huh. you know? That's why I never got to see him. Right, yeah. And, you know, if you were on watch, when he had it around, that was less. You know, you never got got to see it. And Griffith say, well, I, they said so and so, you know. The Time magazine was the thing. I still read it. <laughs> I still read it. Bob, I'm sorry I interrupted you there. I had to had to change tapes. Uh, I'm trying to think where we left off. Uh, um, uh, Kwajalein. Kwajalein, I think, is where we... It's like Pantinian, Guam. You know, somewhere in there, we made a trip down to uh, support the carrier uh, carriers in landing at uh, Hollandia Bay in New Guinea. And... Uh, I think that was, golly, that was before before, uh, before uh, uh, Saipan was in there somewhere. I'd have to look in the ship's history mm -hmm. to uh, get that exactly. But when we were down there, we're the morning they were landing. Landing the first morning of the landing, uh, they were launching planes, and Griff and I were on the uh, 
rear structure, you know, just watching. We weren't at, at battle stations yet. And we were watching and a plane came off the carrier and dropped down to the water. His engine was worn out and he was overloaded and his tail wheel was skipping on the wave tops, you know. And he was gaining a little bit of altitude, but he was coming right up astern of us and mm. and he was getting close and Griff and I ran from the the, the, the deck aft around at the front uh, on the on the boat deck where we were sheltered from him and he hit our our, our main mast back there and he dragged his wing we had an antenna swung between it and the foremast and he dragged his wing on that you could see the sparks flying and he managed to swing off to the right just a little bit but he hit our starboard yard arm and tore his plane up and he fell on our port bow wow. and uh, it was a torpedo plane so there were three men in the crew and when he crossed the bow of our ship he took one of our men off that was waiting waiting to go out to uh, you know, the early morning GQ. So there were four men lost and, and uh, I don't know, um, we had a big burn mark on the side of the ship until I don't know when, when we could finally get to a place where we could paint it. Wow. Oh, boy. And that was, uh, and I found out later that my brother-in-law landed there. Is that right? Yeah. He, he was in the Army. Uh, he wasn't my brother-in-law then yeah. yet either. <laughs> but Did, uh, one question I always like to ask along those lines, uh, throughout your travels, uh, during that time, did you ever come across anybody you knew, uh, anybody from home or a relative or anybody? Um, no, but I was close. But uh, I, I ran across one man from the hometown, but that was back, that was in 1945 when I was back in the States. Oh, okay. He was just a young lad out of boot camp. Mm, okay. And uh, met him at Alameda Naval Air Station. Okay. I think he went to sea after that. You know, so continue on then with your story. Where, where did you guys go from? The Saipan. Oh, we made, uh, uh, somewhere in there, we made another raid on Truck Island. And uh, we had made a swing around uh, several islands. And I know we spent two days, uh, oh, it was something like three or four months before the landing on Iwo Jima. Uh, they landed there in February. And uh, when I was I was home on leave then, but uh, we went, I know we we spent a couple of days there, and uh, we just would go around and let them know we were coming. I don't know if we did like at Iwo. I, we probably didn't do much damage, but they knew knew <laughs> we were coming after yeah, them. Yeah. You know, and they probably started digging deeper and and uh, getting more guys in. And. Uh, so we, you would, uh, during this time, you had had an opportunity to go home? You had a, a, a leave uh, to come home? Not yet, no. Oh, oh, oh I, I thought when, when you guys were at Emo, you said you were not uh, you were on leave. No, I, I was home on leave when they landed there. Oh, oh okay. But, but that was, they landed there in uh, uh, early July, I think. No, no, it was, um, no, I'm wrong, it was February. It was July when... Something else happened. We'll get to that later. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, we made a trip uh, through the Bonin Islands. And we hit three or four islands. Whenever we got close to something that had an airstrip, we'd uh, uh, well, like at, after the uh, landings on uh, Tarawa Macon, we went up to Kwajalein and, and uh, just with the carriers, you know, and brought, wiped out airfields, and we had a. Uh, eight hour uh, or six hour air attack one night through all, all through night mm. through the night uh, we were on, on the guns all day that day wow. and uh, uh, finally the uh, I can't remember one of the carriers got hit got a torpedo from a sub and we were escorting her out, out you know out of the uh, thing and uh, out of the force and we es escorted her back to Pearl at the, uh, then. But there was a man from my hometown on the carrier. Oh, is that right? Yeah. 
Yeah, huh. I knew he was on the carrier. And uh, when I got to Pearl, I mailed a letter and I said, Kyle will be home for Christmas. And sure enough, he was. <laughs> <laughs> so worked out good. The, the thing to do was when you got to leave was to come in unexpectedly, you know. He didn't let anybody know. So. Uh -huh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So after Saipan, um, yeah, we made, made a made a tour. We helped land troops on Peleliu, and uh, we escorted. We were escorting carriers. We didn't do any bombarding. And uh, the landing on Leyte, we attended uh, carriers, and we got broken off with another, uh, uh, well, two other Kara cruisers. And, uh, well, the whole fleet went north. We were going north to catch the, these so-called carriers coming down from Japan. Mm -hmm. Well, they did come down, but they didn't have planes. They just couldn't build them anymore. And uh, uh, then they got word that the big action was happening at down at Leyte, so that everybody turned around, but they left three cruisers. And we continued the chase, and in the afternoon we came on a carrier that was um, listing and dead in the water. And uh, we we thought it, we were far enough away. I thought we, we all thought it was abandoned, but it was full of troops. I read that later. Hmm. We put her down with gunfire, and there was nobody there to rescue them, of course. And at night. We came on, uh, there were three uh, um, ships that were somewhere between light cruiser and, and, and uh, destroyer in size. And we came on three of them and two of them took off and one of them stayed around to keep hold, of, hold us off. And so we had a night exchange of gunfire and uh, we very, you know, it wasn't too long we put the, the, that ship down and uh, the war battle was over. But when we were fighting, when we were fighting them, we didn't fire at first. The two cruisers ahead of us did. And uh, when we fired, they turned a gun on us. And, and uh, I was up on the boat deck with a bunch of guys and one of our officers was there, one of our pilots. And a shell came over, and you know what they sound like a, like a freight train. Is that right? Oh, jeez. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, we all hit the deck except the officer. And he turns around. And he says, "Don't you guys know that when a, you can hear the shell, it's already passed?" And then zoom, the second one came. Then he got down. <laughs> <laughs> so he he wasn't as smart as he thought he was. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes uh, uh, really weren't. We never really had much to do with our officers. And we had one officer that uh, had a penchant for making a fool of himself. And early on, somewhere we were steaming somewhere, and we're, it was kind of a stormy day. You know, the wind was up and and uh, the waves were high and and. Uh, we had a plane, one of our first planes that we took, took, took uh, you know, uh, brought out with us. They were only supposed to spend 18 months at sea, and they were supposed to go in for overall over a certain number of hours. And she was over both the plane, and it was up on the catapult. We're steaming into the wind, and the prop is windmilling. And this guy comes running back, this officer comes running back and says, you can then get some ropes and get up there and tie that prop down. And one of the mechanics, Gordy Graham, he's still alive, lives in uh, Washington. Uh, <laughs> looks at it with a big grin and he says, what for? It turns over like that when you're flying, don't it? <laughs> and, and he has a round face and back to the water. <laughs> and um, what, oh, it was another time, um, uh, we were all sitting, we we're going somewhere, and we we're all sitting around in our neck shack, which was what our machinist shop is what we called it. We had a little space in the hangar, it was walled off from the hangar with expanded steel mesh. Now, you couldn't smoke out 
by the planes, but you, inside that mesh, you could smoke, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, we had our welding torch in there, and, and uh, we were all sitting around smoking, and the gunner, gunner had uh, a tray of carbon tet on the workbench, and he had a couple of gun barrels in there that he was going to clean. And this officer comes back, and he's that carbon tet smells. Well, we were getting plenty of air, you know, because it, it'll put you down. And uh, he smells this, and he says, don't you guys, you guys put out those cigarettes. You want to blow this place up? And Gordy hit him again with, what for? It's the same stuff you got in your fire extinguisher, ain't it? <laughs> and, and they did. They had, <laughs> Yeah, a carbon tet would, uh, you know, in a closed space would evaporate and exclude the oxygen. And uh, it travels toward heat, too. And it's deadly if you can't get air. Huh. They modified it, brought out some newer stuff when I was working at Woodward. Uh, still attracted to heat, and it was still deadly, but it was supposed to be safer. <laughs> And it wasn't. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, let's see, we uh, well, the Lady Gulf and, and uh, the ships down. And, you know, the kamikazes were coming out then. Oh, jeez. And uh, when we got a call for an air attack, we'd run to our gun, gun stations with our head looking up, holding, looking up, you know because they were coming, and uh, uh, um, uh, oh yeah, the first first time we came out, they came over, and they were after the carriers, of course, and we were in the perimeter, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd fire, and we'd fire, follow them on in, well, we had to quit doing that because our shrapnel was falling on our, on our ships, you know, so when they got past us, we couldn't fire anymore. And one day, uh, this this happened, a, a, a plane got past us, and uh, he was only at a couple hundred feet, and he uh, dropped his bomb on the bell of wood, set her afire, hit the fan tail with all the planes parked on it, set her afire, and then he did a wing over and hit the Franklin, the same place. And uh, of course they turned into the wind, you know, to blow the fire off the ship. And uh, the columns of smoke was just pure then we, you know, couldn't do a thing about it. Mm. And, uh, um, well, you know, we had uh, several attacks like that. Um, I, we, we, you know, we actually shot down about four or five planes ourselves. Um, I've read in books that, uh, you know, some of the historian authors said that 20 millimeters were only put on there to keep the crew busy and uh, because they couldn't hit anything. And the problem was, uh, our problem was we had new and improved st sights. And they used to use the old ring sight. Well, for us, they had a little electric box up on top of the gun that you looked into and it had a, a little inclined uh, uh, smoked or not smoked but uh, frosted glass, lightly frosted. You could see through it but it projected a ret reticle on it. Well you could get on the plane with it but as soon as you turned on the gun that thing would jump uh, up right. and down you couldn't yeah. see the, and then you had to look around the side you know. Yeah. And of course you couldn't catch up, you'd, right. you'd lost track already. And, uh, but we did manage to shoot down four planes and most of them were 20 millimeter, 40 millimeter stuff. I remember one crossing our bow on an attack. We couldn't fire us on the, you know, way in the back, mm -hmm. but the guns up in front were hitting them and you could see the uh, 20 millimeters hitting the side and exploding, you know. And, well, that must have been a sight. Yeah, and those kamikazes, there were times when they, oh, there was one that, uh, dropping on a carrier, they hit him on the, right at the uh, leading edge of the wing, on his uh, left wing. He was on the starboard, on the left side of the ship. Um, 
and you can see the smoke go over from the explosion go over his wing, you know, bottom of the airfoil. And of course, the wing came off and just uh, flipped around and fell into the sea, and the plane fell into a flat spin, and it just screamed like a, you know, with all that torn metal just whipping around, and of course it threw him off course and he hit the water, but that was a terrible sight to watch. Mm. Mm. And, you know, all this time stuff was happening to our minds that at least mine, you know, because um, I was glad that when the war was over, I still had time in the Navy to kind of normalize myself. You know. So you didn't have enough points to, was the Navy on the point system as well as far as getting out of the service? Oh or? yeah, there was a point system, but I was on a six year hitch, so I wasn't going to get out. And uh, I had, a, by the time we hit Saipan, I had enough points to get out then already, you know. Wow. In fact, on Saipan, uh, uh, you know, I, when I, I had a Reader's Digest one time that had a little note on the military and they were talking about some Marines captured a, uh, a couple of Japanese uh, soldiers and, and uh, they had held them like overnight in a cave that they were uh, re taking refuge in and, and uh, during that time they taught them a little English. And, and what they taught him was when they got him to, inter to interrogate him, the first thing he said was, where I stand on point system. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they did that. <laughs> uh, I have another story I don't want to tell on the tape, but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's it. But, um, Yeah, uh, after Saipan, or I mean after uh, uh, Leyte, uh, we attended the landings on Mindoro too. And that, after that we were heading, we were supposed to head back to Majuro uh, because we were, we were trying to refuel on the way back, but we got into the typhoon and uh, we spent uh, most of that day and the night and part of the next day before we got through it. Talk about those uh, that typhoon. I've heard so many stories about uh, those typhoons yeah. and what they were like. What did what did you experience? Well, you could uh, at times you could see <laughs> you know out the salt water was driving in a horizontal. The rain was so like rain, you know, and there was a point where I had to step out on deck, and you were instantly wet to the skin on the you know and. Uh, 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 when you could see them, um, I know I'd see, see a destroyer hit a wave and, and uh, uh, his bow would come out the other side and there was, you know, maybe 10, 15 feet of air underneath them and that had dropped down and then his tail would, uh, you know, would, would, do, would do it stick out and, you know, when that those screws are running free. That ship shakes like a, uh, a thing. Well, as I uh, said, we were all low on fuel, and we had a, I don't know what the degree uh, uh, quotient was, but you, the ship was only supposed to be able to, she had red marks on the roll meter. That was our danger point. Well, we passed that four or five times. Oh, boy. And another thing that when on our ship's bell only rang fore and aft. You know, it didn't ring all the way around. And it was, we were pitching so hard it was ringing. So, uh, we lost uh, three destroyers in that. And I think on the, they were able to pick up 26 men off of one out of mm. 250. And the other two, they got a, a little more than that. I've got that stuff written down, but uh, because I just can't remember that, but yeah. they were the, the Hull, the Monaghan, and the Spence. The Spence was a, uh, for, uh, 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 oh, she was a brand new destroyer. And she had five turrets on her, 300, over 350 men. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they found something over 30. Oh, boy. 
But uh, but the New Orleans made it through without any damage. Uh, you guys made it through. Well, okay. Um, we had one whale boat. That's all we carried, and she had gotten loose and broke her spine or her, not her spine or keel. So she was useless, and we had two planes on the catapult. One was ripped loose and, and dropped halfway down to the well deck, and the other one was. Uh, I think parts were blown off of it. I know that the water was driving so hard that what most of it was fabric, but around the engine it was uh, aluminum, and that wind just drove the paint off off of off wow. those surfaces. Wow. So when it calmed down, and uh, we got them down on the well deck, and they took off some, you know, some of the engine parts that they could salvage, and just mm. threw them over the side. We had no way of uh, repairing them. Right, you know. right. Hmm. But uh, other damage, I did, did, you know, uh, all our deck motors got wet. And of course, the 40 millimeters were water cooled and uh, they had the uh, water pump. They were out. So when we, uh, we had some practice fire uh, going back to the States after that, and they could fire a few rounds and then they had to quit because they're guns just got so hot hmm. but uh, we uh, after the typhoon we got into uh, uh, Ulithi uh, about the uh, 23rd of December Christmas is the next day and oh, uh, this is a 44 or 45 44 yeah okay 44 yeah and uh, an engineering team came aboard and looked us over and uh, I told us that we were close enough to overhaul between that and the deck damage that we had in the motors. They told us uh, that we were going to go back to the States. But we stayed and we had Christmas dinner and uh, we had mail. And we hadn't had mail for you know five or six weeks anyway. And it was glorious. We had oh, food packages and all of it. And we were all just so happy. Oh, <laughs> boy. And we went back, I don't know how long it, it probably, probably took us close to seven days to get back to Pearl and then another four or five back to the States uh, because they wouldn't let us have very much fuel, so we had to go slow. But I know one of the new battleships went back with us because we were. Uh, uh, you know, just cruising, heading back to Pearl and or back to the States, one or the other, and they trained their eight or sixteen-inch guns on us, and everybody got scared. <laughs> and uh, our captain called, and they turned them away. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, at one point, uh, uh, I think they were breaking, training a new new bugler bugler for the bugle calls, you know, and, and he was trying to pipe down Chow and and he got switched into general quarters and we were all standing in line and there were guys down in the mess hall, you know, sitting at these folding tables and eating and when the, he got into that everybody got scared and went and they just, we just every, dropped everything and went to battle stations, you know, that's what we did. Yeah. And of course there's guys down in the mess hall when they stood up, they knocked down the tables. You know, they just collapsed in the benches and they just walked over everything to get out of there. <laughs> and uh, they had to clean that up and start all over again. And, uh -huh. and the captain was on the phone right away. Uh, you know, uh, secure, <laughs> secure the battle stations, you know, <laughs> and, uh, uh -huh. whatever he said. And, yeah. But when you hear that bugle call, bugle call it, you went. <laughs> um, mm. uh, so now you guys then went back, uh, did you go back to Washington uh, no, for yeah, overhaul? We, no, we went back to uh, Mare Island. Okay. And uh, it was on the 11th of January, we steamed under the Golden Gate and then under the Bay Bridge and we sat at anchor while the, the uh, customs came aboard. I don't know what they looked at there. I didn't, I didn't see them. I think they went up to 
to the wardroom and had coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, but it was cold. It was you know, it was January and coming back from Pearl. Oh and, right, yeah. We were, we were uh, our bunks were on the other side of the hangar, so we were partitioned from the hangar with by the uh, steel mesh, and the hangar door was open most of the time, and it was cold up there. I know I had my pea coat by then, and I was under two blankets and had a pea coat on top, <laughs> what? trying to stay warm. Oh, well, your blood was so thin after all those months out. Yeah, out Pacific, coming up yeah. out of the heat, you yeah. know, like that. And uh, after that, um, uh, the air crew, we got transferred over to uh, 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 the Naval Air Station. I can't think of the name right this second. It'll come up. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we went down in the, they put us in, they, they had wooden barracks and they had permanent barracks. And we were down in Splinterville on the wooden barracks. And, <laughs> and uh, they just put us in a, the second deck of uh, barracks, you know, for as long as we're going to be there. And there was a bunch of you know, uh, new recruits that had just come in and, and uh, we had a time with them because, I mean, they, were, they had brought their pajamas. <laughs> Nobody did that. <laughs> and they were all complaining. They had come down to, to uh, uh, the Naval Air Station on a, a ship a lot from Seattle along the, the uh, right along the coast and they were riding the ground swells all the way down and they were all seasick and <laughs> yeah, we had a time with them and they, they said didn't you ever get seasick and nah no nah, we just kept through the typhoon <laughs> but there were guys that got sick in that typhoon that had never gotten sick before but uh, it didn't bother me at that be darn, huh? So now when you guys came back yeah, for the overhaul, did that pretty much take you out of the war? Or, or? Yeah, okay. yeah, the war was over for us then. Yeah. yeah, and uh, they sent half of us on leave right away, and uh, the other half of us stayed, you know, at the Naval Air Station, and we unloaded our gear from the ship. They'd drive us, take us over there in a, a truck, and uh, I know we had a time, we had a, had a game with the truck driver because he had never been to sea either and and we had about uh, oh, 50 feet of 12 thread line back there for tying stuff down and we were going over there one time and it took all you know three or four of us to do this but we we unlaid half of that rope and did about four inches of fancy work and then laid it back up and <laughs> he couldn't figure out how we did that. <laughs> but we had, you know, we had like an hour and a half, two hour drive over there. So <laughs> we took all the gear off the ship. She was at uh, Port Chicago when we did that. You know, that was the port, uh, the ammunition port. That was right. the first thing they were taking off the ship. Uh, that had blown up uh, oh, right. uh -huh. Uh -huh. About six or eight months before something that was all rebuilt. I had I read some stories on that too. That was yeah. a terrible thing. But uh, I made the second leave, and so it was at the end of February before I got home. How was that homecoming after being away for so long and oh. everything you'd been through? It must have been a great feeling to be home. Culture shock city. Was it? Yeah. There, years, yeah. I was. I, I got so I couldn't eat. Huh. And. Uh, until I got back on the train and there was a bunch of, you know, it was full of servicemen. And Is that I was right? back home again, you know. I'll be there. Uh, I had, had an awful time. I didn't realize how how bad that hurt me uh, mentally, you know. Really? Uh, as I, I said, you know, I had about three years after the war was over to normalize pretty much, and I did, but... Um, uh, 1978, I was out, of course, and we went to a funeral for Amy's cousin, and uh, I was beginning to loosen up then a little bit. I mean, did you say uh, 48? 78. 78? 78. Yeah. It, it took that long 
that, you know, before I could loosen is up. Is that right? Uh, you know, like I, my, I had been out, and my folks had passed away, and you know, and I couldn't cry. I didn't feel anything. Wow. Huh. When Colin, Colin by me came, we sat at the table, listened to the news, and we just both cried. I finally got to that point. Hmm. But it, 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 well, she could attest to how I used to thrash around in bed, uh, you know, to tear all the clothes, you know, the sheets are all loose, and then shout, and... Oh, uh, boy. You know, I never had a visual, uh, re a dream that I could remember, but I must have been, you know. Hmm. Well, other people react differently, I guess, but... I bottled up all those years. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was after that before I could get to the point where some real emotion could, you know, would come out. Wow. wow. Uh, was the, the Navy of any, serv any help in that way as far as, uh, they didn't have counseling and stuff back then, they were just, nothing, you were on your own type of... No, during world, like, uh, what's that? Dirty word comedian. He said uh, in World War One it was two syllables. It was shell shock. World War Two it was four cylinders. Battle fatigue. And now it's post traumatic syndrome. Right. You know? It doesn't even relate to what you did. Huh. Yeah. So true. Well, I. Uh, Repaired. Uh, they were, when I got off the ship and I was stationed at Alameda Naval Air Station. That's it. it okay. Came yeah. out. Uh, they were putting a new plane on the cruisers and battleships. They were taking off the float planes, and putting on another float plane. But it was uh, they called it the SC-1 Scout. SC. Uh, C was for Curtis, and one was the first model of it. Uh, she was a single place plane, had a bigger engine, she was faster. And what we were doing was putting it, there was a access door behind the cockpit, uh, big enough for a man to get into the fuselage back there. And what we were doing was uh, either repairing the floats or we were installing a bunk in there so that uh, with uh, safety straps and uh, safety belts and such, so that they could pick up um, two people in the bunk, uh, you know, and, and there was a little ladder that went with that. It was almost kind of, kind of. That was that was fun. I learned a lot then. I, I was a third class metalsmith, but I had no no experience, you know, aboard ship. But I I, I sure learned my trade there. And there was one lad uh, training up to go out to sea. A metalsmith named Hale Hopper made the Indianapolis, and uh, he didn't come back. Wow. Uh, a couple of guys uh, from that uh, the V division, when they when they came back to to the states, they came over to talk to us, and they said Hal just uh, uh, saw an island and swam off. And that was it. You know. Mm. Well, Alameda, they transferred us, the whole squadron, then the war ended, and, and uh, oh yeah, we also uh, patched up old uh, obsolete float planes to take out the Pacific for those atom bomb tests. You know, we worked on those. When, when that was over and everything was cooled down, we, they transferred us down to uh, Terminal Island near uh, Los Angeles or near uh, Long Beach is real. And Howard Hughes' plane was in the dry dock there. That big old thing? Yeah. Yeah. It had cost him a million dollars a mile in, in those days to move everything out of the way so he could get that thing down to the water wow. from his plant. And uh, I remember going right into town on the bus and there was a what would have been a handhold on our plane, you know, big enough to put your hand in. There was a man 
man had one old oak one on the tail fin standing in it, you know. Jeez. <laughs> that uh, was a big pine. Wow. The spruce goose. Yeah, right, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, have, yeah, I got transferred from there down to Corpus Christi. And uh, I spent most of the last two years of my time down there, or most of the last two years. Yeah, and, and nobody liked it down there because they didn't like us either. You know, they'd, uh, if you got in trouble on the beach, the sheriff's deputies, had, uh, you know, they they carried a little 25 automatic, but and they'd pull it, but they didn't want to shoot you. They wanted to cut your head open with the butt, you know. And uh, I know there were f three guys, and you know, that. <coughs> The station was building up with guys coming off the ships, you know, and uh, there were three guys that palled around together. Uh, one of them six, stood about 6'2", and the other two were shorter, but none of them weighed under 200 pounds, and they were, and it wasn't fat either, you know, and uh, one of them got into a fight in the bar one night, according to the story, and it, it, he and the civilian went out and back and were fighting and about that time the sheriff's deputy came roaring in the front door and headed right out the back. Well, when he went out in the back, the other two guys went out there too. And uh, I don't know who, what happened to the, with the deputy, but when those three guys came back, they had his gun and his sap and his badge <laughs> and his wallet. <laughs> yeah. and, and, after that, at the, on the air station, and somebody come in the barracks and say, "Hey, look at this neat little 25 automatic I just bought." Yeah, what'd you pay for that? 25 bucks. You know who's that was? And he said, so "You'd hear that he'd run right out and start selling it." That thing passed passed around until finally somebody took it home, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so you finished out your service uh, there in yeah. Corpus Christi. So let me, uh, just to clarify, so when you went into the service, you signed up for a six-year stint then? Yeah. You, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were no jobs. Oh, okay. Gotcha. In uh, particular. And, and uh, actually, I probably would have stayed in if I hadn't been, I was second class uh, aviation metalsmith by that time. And I had passed all the tests for first class, but... Uh, they were cutting everything back, so you couldn't, they wouldn't advance you unless there was an opening. And if you were in Corpus like I was, and the opening was in, on the East Coast, they wouldn't transfer you there to fill it, you know. Hmm. They'd fill it with somebody. They had a dozen guys yeah. waiting there, too, right. you know. Right. So when my time came up, I, uh, uh, I went home, and uh, uh, the Feb February of 49, I started at the University of Illinois, February semester. Uh, uh, before I got out, though, I, to get, just to get away from Corpus, I went to Memphis, uh, NAATC, Naval Air, something or other, <laughs> repair station, uh, they, as a school, and uh, uh, that was a six-month deal. And when I got through with that, uh, I had 60 days leave. They said, you got, you've got 90 coming, but you can take 60. So I was home for Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's that year. That was really nice. Yeah, I'll bet. And uh, um, let's see. Also from Corpus, or from, yeah, from Corpus, I had taken a 30-day leave, I think, and I was home for my older sister's wedding. That was kind of nice. I hitchhiked home on that one, that trip. Hmm. Just, uh, not that I didn't have the money, I just wanted the, the adventure of it. experience. Yeah. You know. yeah. And, uh, so you're out and you enroll in the University of Illinois. Uh, yeah, and uh, I... Uh, got into painting and printmaking, and my aim was to get at the sculpture. And uh, I, you know, we got a little taste of it there, but it was thoroughly organized. And uh, after I 
finished school, I was painting, you know, and I was doing some stuff at home, but uh, after I after that finished that, that was, uh, we were married in 51, so we spent the last year of school down, or in, of my uh, schooling down at, in student housing down there. Did you meet at, at, uh, at school? No, oh. no. My, my sister and my wife were working at Argonne National Laboratory, and my sister set us up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I was studying painting and printmaking, and uh, when I got out of school, uh, you know, all those night watches I stood out at sea, I had decided that at somewhere along the line I was going to, along the line I was going to build my own home. And so, uh, I worked as a carpenter. I poured a lot of concrete and I worked as a carpenter. And uh, we did build a house uh, in Downers Grove, Illinois, which we uh, rented. Well, you know, I <coughs> worked at that for around nine years and, and uh, I could see it was going nowhere. So I went back in, to Illinois and I got a graduate degree. And, um, what did you get your undergraduate in? Fine arts? Is that yeah. Uh, okay? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, painting and printmaking. And uh, I didn't like printmaking, it was a pain in the butt. But uh, what I could do was I uh, spent some side time working nights um, uh, in the sculpture room, you know, because they keep it open so the kids could come in and work and I could get at the welding torch there. So I was able to start welding. Uh, some of the stuff that's copper around here, like that fish uh, up on the wall up here, uh, I, I made when I were, before I came, went back for the degree, I couldn't weld, but I could soft solder. No, <laughs> I didn't even have enough heat to sil silver solder at the time, you know. So anyway, I could, uh, I could get at the welding torch and uh, when I finished uh, with the degree, uh, I went in town and bought my own torches. And I taught at Illinois for a year uh, because I had trouble locating a job. And then I got a job at Southern Illinois, or uh, uh, Central. Eastern. Yeah, Eastern Illinois University. Uh, university is supposed to be a collection of colleges, but this was a a teacher's college, but the uh, music department had separated, so, but they made all of them, the state legislature, legislature just pro pronounced them all universities at the time. Anyway, yeah, because uh, if you looked at a map from Indiana, they would point out the school as Eastern Illinois State Teachers University or something <laughs> like that, you know. <laughs> and I, I taught there for three years. And uh, now we moved out here to teach at CSU. And, and w so, what did you teach then? It's uh, at uh, the college? drawing, drawing, and uh, oh wow, okay, and uh, uh, basic design mostly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, basic design. Yeah, because that, uh, and out here it was kind of a, a loser because at uh, Eastern uh, the classrooms when they built them were built to hold no more than 16 to 18 students. And out here I had almost 40. You know, and I, uh, in a two hour class meeting, I couldn't even talk to, I right. couldn't take a yeah, roll because yeah. I to, it, it would take too long. So I abandoned that and, and just uh, tried to teach what I could. But most of the class was, most of the class was, um, um, Home economic students, they had to take a year of art, and, and uh, so my course was one of them. But, uh, the three-dimensional uh, part, uh, we had a room uh, here that had a, a table saw and a band saw and a, a welding torch and and uh, a sander and stuff like that and. And uh, that was a good room. I liked that one. 
except that they wax the floor. And uh, if you're cutting a piece of wood on the table saw and you're pushing, you could slip. Mm -hmm. So I had a can of sand in my locker or in my office. And I'd bring that down and when they'd wax the floor, I'd sand it <laughs> so we didn't slip and fall and hurt ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So did you finish out your career then at TSU? Yeah, they didn't like me and I got, uh, they wouldn't give me tenure, so I, you know, I, uh, when the four years was up, it was 1971, I went out and, well, I worked on my own for about two years. Uh, and we tried to tried to run a uh, um, furniture store that failed. And but I got a job in a machine shop finally at down in town, Snyder Miller's, and and uh, eventually, uh, well, I worked at Forney's for a bit, and uh, finally got on at Woodward and retired there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you had mentioned earlier you guys had built the house in Illinois, but uh, you also built this house, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, uh, we moved out here in, you know, in 67, and in 68 I bought the lot and started to, started to build it. Actually, I didn't get started on anything until we had a three-day weekend over the 4th of July, and the, they had just taken off the farm, so I couldn't do anything about getting lumber out here, so I... I had, I backfilled the yard, whatever, and that was only out and back. The only place I had any dirt, front I had to fill mostly, you know. And uh, we, we put up the house, we moved in in September. Uh, it wasn't even waterproof when we moved in. <laughs> but, and uh, we had ladders from the basement, we were living in the basement, literally. We cooked and ate down there. And we had a ladder up here, and we and up to the second floor. And uh, she got so she, well, the refrigerator was up here. And so she, to carry food down, she could walk down this ladder face forward with food in her hands uh, <laughs> and not hold on. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, Bob, we'll, we'll start to wind down this interview. Um, was there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Or maybe if you wanted to pipe in, if there's anything, any stories you left out you can think of uh, so that we round out this interview to make sure we didn't miss anything. If, if not, uh, hopefully we caught everything and we'll... Oh, I think we caught most of the points okay. that I can, I can think of. Yeah. Do you have anything to add, sweetie? I don't know. Do you want to talk about your airplane you know, you guys... Had fun with in California. Oh, that's a, a point I missed. Yeah, uh, when I was stationed at Alameda Naval Air Station, uh, one of the guys off the ship had a private license, and they had just opened the airport at uh, a private airport at uh, San Jose, and so uh, he, he talked me into going down there, and I took flying lessons. And there were two other guys he talked into, and the four of us. Uh, after we got uh, cleared to fly solo, uh, kicked our money together and we bought a PT-23. Oh. That was a single engine uh, metal fuselage um, training plane that the service used. They didn't use very many of them, but they were, they were sweet. And uh, we uh, got it down at San Jose and we had to do a little, little work on it. Um, the, f the fabric wings and tail were checked and we, we had to rejuvenate the fabric and we p polished the fuselage bright because it, it was just tarnished and the only bright spot was where we washed off the American insignia on, insignia on the sign. So we polished that all off and painted the nose red and, and, uh, and uh, it was kind of plain. If we flew into a uh, another airport on Sunday and sat down and went in for a cup of coffee. People would get out of their cars and stand in front of it and take each other's pictures. Oh, was that right? Yeah, it uh, was cool. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, one by one, of course, the war was over then, and and the guys got discharged, and and uh, finally it was down to Thax and me, and we had to sell the plane, 
we knew that because the other two guys had gotten out and Thax was coming up and so we sold the plane and, and uh, it kind of tore us up doing that. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, hmm. Well, one last question I have for you, um, and you kind of talked a little bit about it earlier. How do you think the war affected you or changed you or played a role in your life? Or did it? Or was it just simply just a chapter you went through? Uh, how would you answer that? Well, it's pretty much a chapter, but I know one thing. I, I, you know, I had decided I wanted to build a house and I didn't want to ride the train back and forth to Chicago. You know, I, I just didn't want to do that. Because that was what most people did, you know, at the time. Uh -huh. Probably a lot later. And, and you said a lot of that thought came to you as you were doing Night Watch when you had all that time to, yeah, to think and... Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, it was dark out there. Uh, there were times when you could actually see a rainbow at night. They were white, but they were and very faint, but wow. they yeah. were there. And uh, I told them that story when I got home on leave one time and they didn't, nobody believed me. I know they just sat there and looked at me. I know they thought I was lying. <laughs> <laughs> uh. hmm. yeah. uh, but like, like um, uh, Kurt says, when you did, when you don't know it, make it up. No. <laughs> uh, you don't know the answer, make one up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bob, I want to thank you for sitting down to, yeah. to tell your story today, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Yeah. Uh, you know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't thank me, I got drafted. <laughs> uh, that's the plane that got shot down at Wake Island. And the, uh, Lieutenant Roberts is uh, probably, I, I don't know which one he is, but uh, he's in the front row. That's all. And and are you in this picture as well? Yeah, I'm way in the back up here somewhere. Uh, just, you can just barely see my face. Okay. I, I can't tell. See it from here. I, yeah, that's probably me. Okay. No special comment. That's, that's the USS yeah. New Orleans there? Yes, and there's a caption under it. We were probably coming back from somewhere and that was taken. Let's see, New Orleans taken from Yorktown after the Truck Island Raid. Right. April 29th, 1944. That was probably taken uh, on the way back up from uh, uh, the Admiralty Islands because we got our, uh, we made, made the trip and the two ball-headed men are our two new pilots. <laughs> and, and once again, where, do you know where you are in this picture? I'm not in this picture. Okay. I was on watch. I, okay. Uh, no special comment. Once again, the, the New Orleans? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're probably coming from somewhere. There's a caption under it, I guess. Bob, can you say a little bit about uh, about this, how this came together, this little, uh, this yeah, neat little... Uh, it's my... Uh, uh, the blue ribbon is the uh, American Theater ribbon. You just got that for being on the coast. And the next one with the stars in it is my uh, uh, Asiatic Pacific ribbon. And uh, the next one is... Uh, the red one is Philippine Liberation. And then there's... Uh, below that, there's two ones. The one that's all one color is a good conduct medal and the other is a Philippine victory medal issued by the uh, Philippine government. The round things are just buttons from recent reunion associations.